in terms of fire issues, the thing that has really captured people's attention is we're seeing a change in California in fire issues. Since the year 2000, there's been a doubling of the amount of area burned relative to the prior two decades, because this is something that's captured a lot of attention. It's particularly important in the Santa Monica Mountains because we have a lot of concerns in, in this part of the world. There are substantial natural resources, and so we're concerned about what is the impact of these fires on ecosystem recovery. I'll touch very briefly on that. Uh, there are also a great many significant historical uh, resources. This was a, uh, a really important uh, Native American uh, sites in, uh, prior to uh, European uh, colonization. So we're going to talk, maybe not going back that far, but certainly the history of burning patterns in the Santa Monica. And then finally, increasing human developments happening at an incredible pace all over the state. And we need to understand how this is impacting fires and how fire is impacting development. Go ahead, Eric. Now, if you go into one of these sites, like after the Woolsey fire right after, it looks something like this. It looks like it's pretty much destroyed. Uh, and that's because the fires we have are naturally all high intensity, what we call crown fires. They burn everything right to the ground. Go ahead. But you go out in the first spring after the fire and it all greens up. It looks something like this. Uh, and so it has the ability to recover very rapidly under most conditions. Uh, go ahead, Eric. Uh, they come back in a variety of ways. Some of these shrubs, like the common chamois shrub, re-sprouts from the very base of the shrub, as you can see there. Go ahead. But chamois also has seeds that it's produced over a period of decades or even longer, and those seeds sit dormant in the soil, and they're stimulated to germinate by the fire. Another one? Another common shrub is California lilac or ceanothus. They too have seeds that sit in the soil, they wait till a fire comes, and then they're triggered to germinate by the fire. Next. And within like a couple years after the fire, the, uh, most of these chaparral sites are starting well on their way to recovery. And so fire per se is not a problem for these ecosystems. Go ahead. One of the striking things about post-fire environments, though, in the Santa Monica's is we have a plethora of wildflowers that very often, go ahead, go back. We have a plethora of wildfire flowers that uh, are seldom seen when their uh, chaparral vegetation is intact. It's only after that shrubland has been burned off that we get this vast display of different wildflowers coming up. And that's an interesting story in our chaparral landscapes because most of these species have seeds that will lay dormant in the soil for as long as a century. They require smoke from the fire to trigger their germination. And there's been a lot of research in recent years on what it is in smoke. One, certainly one of the components is nitrogen dioxide in smoke at very tiny amounts. 500 parts per million will trigger germination of many of these species. Indicates there's a long coevolutionary history uh, between fire and this, these ecosystems. Go ahead, next. Uh, just to summarize what we can say about uh, the impact of these fires on chaparral shrublands, um, not only is chaparral adapted to these fires, but it's actually dependent. We think of it as a fire-dependent vegetation because they have seeds that simply won't re uh, germinate and recruit until there's a fire. So they have to have a fire in order to continue their life history. Um, However, one of the important things about this adaptation of chaparral to fire is it's very sensitive to the interval between fires. Historically, we believe that in the Santa Monica Mountains, fires probably burned on the order of 30 to 130 year intervals, and the chaparral is very resilient to that frequency. However, Today, humans are responsible for 99% of all our fires, and they've greatly increased that frequency. Go ahead. And what happens when you increase that frequency, 
So you have more than a fire every 30 years, but in this case, this is an area from Topanga Canyon. This is what the vegetation looks like when it's burned maybe at a, a normal frequency of every 30 years, dominated by evergreen shrubs. This is what happens when you get three fires in 12 years. Basically, most of the species are extirpated from the site. A few things like these laurel leaf sumac are capable of resprouting and persist, but mostly what you have is exotic grasslands. And these are not native species, they come in, and they have a lot of uh, uh, impact on our natural resources. Number one, they're not native, so it changes the conservation value of these landscapes. Uh, it goes from almost all native species to mostly all non-native species. It impacts the hydrology of the landscape. These shrubs are capable of holding water on those steep slopes much better than the shallow-rooted grasses. Has impacts on the fire regime, too. This landscape here burns about every six months. This landscape here can burn any, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I, it's only flammable about six months out of the year, whereas this landscape here is flammable 12 months out of the year. So a lot of changes happen when we uh, uh, increase fire frequency and cause the uh, uh, invasion of these non-native species. Go ahead, next. We also play a role in this invasion process. The Woolsey fire, when it occurred, there were a lot of uh, fire breaks produced by bulldozers around the edge of the Woolsey fire to uh, preserve homes. These areas are just prime areas for invasion of non-native species. So that's another issue that needs to be dealt with with respect to fires and non-natives. Go ahead. Now, the Woolsey fire, of course, is the thing that captured most people's attention in recent uh, years. Go ahead, next. But there are a number of interesting fires that have occurred in the Santa Monica that have captured a lot of attention. Uh, 1961, the Bel Air uh, fire uh, was noted because it burned through a landscape that had a lot of homes, and those homes had a lot of celebrities. And so there are quite a few Hollywood celebrities that got burned out of their house. Go ahead, next. Really? Oh, interesting. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, look just like that. Vice, this was Vice President Richard Nixon at the time, who lived in Bel Air. And uh, this is a classical picture. Eric remembers it very well. Um, this has played uh, in a lot of different venues. Go ahead, next. Now, one of the fires that is perhaps most interesting is the Santa Monica Mountains was the site in 1933 of a very small fire, 40 acres, but it's noted as being up until 2018, it accounted for more deaths in a fire than any other fire in the past. There were 33 men that were killed fighting the uh, fire. And this all came about because of the CCC program. They had all of these laborers working in Griffith Park doing various projects. Then an arson started a fire down here towards the edge of uh, the mountains. And the uh, CCE workers were uh, forced to go fight that fire. In fact, that's historically was the case of how fires got fought, is uh, in the past, before we had organized fire departments, uh, anybody who happened to be around at the time of a fire was required by law to help fight those fires. Go ahead, next. Now, the one characteristic of our fires is they almost all, at least the big ones, are driven by this uh, synoptic weather condition. By synoptic, we mean it's a condition set up over the, the region, uh, including the Great Basin, where you get a high-pressure cell. And if you have a low-pressure cell off the coast, you get this pressure gradient that uh, pushes air masses uh, offshore. And this is a fire near Malibu. Here's Malibu here. And you can see that smoke plume moving out into uh, the water. This is characteristic of most of our uh, big fires in the state. Go ahead, next. These fires are driven by Santa Ana winds. And this bar graph here shows uh, from January through December the distribution of these winds. They're predominantly in the autumn. And that's particularly dangerous. Go ahead, next. 
because if you look at the climate in California, these bars here represent the rainy season, the dots represent the dry season, those Santa Ana winds come at the end of our dry season. So it's the worst possible conditions for wildfires, and that's where we get the worst fires. Go ahead. Now, just go through this, Eric, sort of gradually to just describe. This is the 1993, I believe, uh, Green Meadow Fire. And what you see here is the time frame, and you see how the fire spread. So this is 12.30 in the afternoon. Two hours later, it's almost doubled, more than doubled in size. Go ahead. Uh, by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it's uh, probably three or four times the size it was earlier on. Keep going. Just stream through this, just to get an idea of what happens in these Santa Ana-driven fires. They move extremely fast. And that's one of the reasons they're so deadly. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, wind-driven fire that consumed the town of Paradise, from the time it ignited to the time it hit Paradise, it was an hour and a half. So it moved extremely fast. And when these fires are moving so rapidly, um, it's the primary re uh, reason these are such a problem for humans. Go ahead, next. Now, one of the things that is important to realize is these fires we've had uh, for a very long period of time, in fact, we have records of big fires in the Santa Monica Mountains going back to the 1880s, uh, and almost certainly there were big ones before that. Uh, here's uh, Malibu here, Point Doom, and next slide will show the what we've seen historically. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, this is something from the LA Times, a beautiful illustration of what we've seen about every 10 years in the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, going back to the 20s. But 1935, we had the Malibu fire, 28,000 acres. Uh, 10 years later, 15,000 uh, Woodland Hills fire. Uh, 1956, the Sherwood Zuma fire, 38,000 acres. Uh, and a number of other somewhat smaller fires. 1970, the Wright Fire, 28,000 acres. Uh, you go up 10 years, 1982, the Dayton Canyon Fire, 44,000 acres. The Green Meadow Fire in 93, 38,000 uh, acres. And later in the six, uh, 90s, we have the Calabasas Fire, and then ultimately here, the Woolsey Fire. So we've had a long history of these fires. They're nothing new. All of these have been driven by these Santa Ana winds. And so that's the real uh, uh, trick in terms of understanding our fire situation, is how do we deal with these fires that are driven by these extreme winds for which we have no control over? Go ahead, next. Now, it's important, in, particularly in the discussion that Bettina and I will have, to recognize uh, how unique Southern California is relative to much of the rest of the state, because a lot of what you hear in the media has to do with fires in other parts of California. So I'll just give you a very quick primer on how to think about fire throughout California. It's the southern part of the state. We have mostly shrublands, and we have a lot of people, about 10 times what you find in the northern part of the state. Uh, and much of that is forested. In terms of numbers of fires, uh, 475 versus 4,700, about an order of magnitude more fires in this part of the state. And in terms of the cause, uh, a good many of the fires in the north are started by lightning. They're natural lightning ignited fires. Here, 99% of our fires are started by people. Uh, it's also been, uh, it's important to realize that the management of California has varied from one part of the state to the next. The blue areas indicate national forests, and the blue indicates the extent to which those areas uh, have missed fires in the last 100 years relative to what we think the historical frequency is or, or was. And the blues indicate there's a deficit. In other words, all our forests have been missing fires because we're really good at putting out fires in forests. 
We're not very good at putting out fires in the southern part of the state. We have no deficit. In fact, the yellows indicate an excess. We've had way more fire in the last 100 years than we believe historically was ever the case. Next. And one of the things that's reflected in this is uh, the factors that drive these fires. In the northern part of the state, uh, we have had a deficit of burning in the last 100 years. We've accumulated a lot of dangerous fuels. A and so much of the landscape is without, has not been burned in a very long time. And so there's a lot of dangerous fuels. And this diagram here shows a fire that occurred up in the northeastern part of the state in 2012. And the colored areas indicate previous fires. What you can see is most of that landscape had never burned since 1910. And so you have fires burning in landscapes that basically have missed fires for a century. And that's the primary problem with fires in the Sierra Nevada. We have a lot of dangerous fuels. And what it tells us is something uh, along the lines of what we need to do to solve the fire problem in the Sierra Nevada forest. And it largely centers around fuel treatments. Uh, next. But if you look at Cal uh, Southern California, this is the Woolsey Fire. And the perimeter of the Woolsey Fire goes all around like this. And it's hard to find any area in there that hasn't burned. And much of that area has burned repeatedly uh, in the last 100 years. So Southern California doesn't have a problem with excess fuels. We're burning our landscape all the time. Uh, so very different landscape problems than in the Sierra Nevada. So when you hear someone talk about fire in the state, you need to make sure you pin them down. Are you talking about Sierra Nevada forest fires or Southern California wildfires? Go ahead. Now, here's just an illustration uh, to kind of wrap this up uh, that contrasts these fires in the Sierra Nevada, which we call fuel-dominated fires, versus wind-dominated fires. And the wind-dominated fires, we have lots of them historically. Uh, in Orange County, the Santiago Fire of 1889, up until a couple years ago, was the largest fire in the state, over 300,000 acres in size. Uh, 1970, we had the Big Laguna Fire in San Diego, and then again, the Cedar Fire, uh, the Witch Fire, and a whole series of fires in the last decade. One of the things, though, to point out, because it's something that we need to discuss, and that is the causes of these fires. Most of our fires in the Sierras are started by lightning. They're natural lightning-ignited fires. In the last decade, all of our big fires have been started by power line failures. And so this is a major issue that we need to uh, think a lot more about, is how do we deal with uh, these power line failures? Go ahead, next. And this is just an illustration of this problem where we have power lines that uh, uh, are overhead uh, fuels. And if anything fails, like one of those lines snaps during a powerful wind, you're very likely going to ignite a fire. Next. I'll just raise one other issue here because it might came, come up in discussion. And that is we need to understand we've had really severe fires in 2017, 2018 in the southern part of the state. And certainly part of the reason is we've had a really severe drought. We've had a drought that extended from 2012 to 2018. And that drought caused a huge amount of dieback. This is a scene taken a year and a half ago from the Santa Monica Mountains. And all that gray represents dead shrubs. And so we have a massive amount of dead vegetation on the landscape. And that's certainly a factor in accounting for these big fires. And it's an important thing to keep in mind because people are looking at these big fires from 2017, 2018 and saying, well, this is the new normal. This is what we should expect. But if they're the result of this anomalous drought effect, uh, then going forward, we don't necessarily expect uh, six-year droughts like we had recently. And therefore, uh, we might not necessarily expect a repeat of 2017, 2018. And next. Oh, the last thing I'll just raise is the issue of population because there's a lot of discussion today about how climate change and global warming is impacting our fires. And the climatologists will point out 
that since the year 2000, we've had a doubling amount of area burn, and we've also had a steady increase, well, maybe not steady, it's fluctuated, but we've had overall an increase in temperature. And so there's a lot of emphasis on the role of global warming in explaining why we have more and more fires. But one of the things that you need to keep in mind is our big fires, particularly in coastal California and like Santa Monica Mountains, are started by people. 100% of them are started by people. And people are increasing in frequency. So since the year 2000, we've had a doubling in area burned. We've also added 6 million more people to the state. And every year, we're adding 300,000 uh, more people. Uh, just take Ventura County, for example, where the Woolsey fire occurred. Uh, just since 2000, we've added 100,000 people uh, to Ventura County. So we're populating the landscape, and this has two potential impacts. One, it increases the probability that someone will start a fire during a Santa Ana wind condition. The more people, the more chances. And then also, because we're putting 300,000 people a year into the state, they're being forced out into, uh, due to urban sprawl, forced out into landscapes that are very hazardous. And so maybe it's not a surprise that we're seeing increases in the number of people killed by fires in uh, recent decades. We just have more people at risk. And I'll just end it there.